Hey, welcome back to Mr. MIG's classroom. I'm Mr. MIG, and in this video, we're again talking about the FAA Part 107 exam. So if you're new to the channel, I ask that you subscribe. If you're not new, I still ask you to subscribe if you haven't yet, and give me a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm. Um, so in this video, particularly, we're going to go over the weather section for the FAA Part 107 drone exam. So this exam is so you can be a licensed drone pilot and fly drones commercially. Um, all right, without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Weather is probably the biggest um, section on the 107 exam, or the second biggest. I would say sectional charts have the most questions and the weather second most. Um, weather is super important. It's definitely an area where I see a lot of students say they struggle. Um, some students have told me they get actually more weather questions than sectional chart questions. Everybody's exam is gonna be a little bit different, but expect some weather questions. You're gonna definitely have some. Um, so here's what we're gonna to do today. I'm gonna to have multiple videos on the weather because it's so big. I'm gonna split it up into three videos. The first video, I'm gonna go over wind, air masses, atmospheric stability, and visibility in clouds. And then I'll do a second video where I'll do icing and fog, density altitude, which is a tricky one. Um, I'll go over the weather briefings. I've already talked about uh, METAR, so I'll do TAFs uh, probably as a second video. And then I'm probably gonna do a third video just on the life cycle of a thunderstorm because that's definitely a question that's usually asked. All right, so let's get into wind here. Well, let's just start with the basic things. Um, you know, the main purpose of these videos is to help you with the exam, but I also want you to know how to good, be a responsible um, UA pilot. And I think that's really important. So one of the things you should know is that the remote pilot in command is, you know, needs to be responsible for weather, weather conditions, where they're at. You know, you obviously you need to know if you're close to an airport, but you are responsible to know the red weather conditions and you need to check those ahead of time. And this is a question they might ask you on the exam to be, in all honesty, who's responsible for knowing the weather conditions. And it's gonna be the remote pilot in command, which they'll abbreviate is PIC, pilot in command or RPIC. Um, uh, let's see, how will weather affect visibility on the flight mission? That's one important thing for the PIC to know, the pilot in command. And uh, will there be proper separation between the SUAS and clouds? Remember that the FAA requires a minimum distance, both horizontally and vertically between your unmanned aerial system and the clouds. So you gotta be 500 feet below the clouds at minimum and 2000 feet horizontally away. I've gotten over, I've gone over that in other videos. So I'm not gonna go over the, that too much in this one. This one's more about the weather. Just remember you need, you are responsible to know how high the clouds are. You gotta look that up um, because you know, the FAA doesn't want an airplane that could be flying through the clouds to come through the clouds and then is landing and then runs into your UA. That's not good, that's bad. All right, so in this one, I built in some questions, or really, I should say, I got these from another teacher, you rock. Um, and so uh, he built in some questions here. And um, yeah, he's awesome. He's also a drone teacher in, uh, in my same state. So uh, uh, anyway, so here's some questions here. Um, every physical process of weather is accompanied by or is the result of a, take a second to think about this. If you want to pause, go ahead. Heat exchange. So heat exchange is what is uh, creating our weather. Obviously, there, there's other things that can contribute, but you're getting heat exchange for the physical process of weather. Um, and these these little things that I'm gonna, these questions in here are exam questions. These are similar to what you could see on the exam. So every physical process of weather is accompanied by or is the result of unequal heating of the Earth's surface. And I'll get into actual stuff. I just wanted to prep you up with some questions. Um, the development of thermals depends on, again, if you want to pause, go ahead, solar heating. All right. And here, give us thermals are updrafts in convection, uh, in convection currents dependent on solar heating. And we'll get into more of that in a second. So warm air has a tendency to rise, cold air has a tendency to descend. Uh, replacing the rising warm air. And this is really important. So when you're getting these, um, when you, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but when there's warm air below the cool air, warm air wants to rise, right? So, and that's when you can get these vertical kind of wind conditions. And that's not good when you're flying, right? You don't, that's what creates uh, turbulence. And that's something you definitely want to be concerned of. All right. 
Wind can affect UAS performance and maneuverability during all phases of the flight. The remote PIC needs to be aware of the following. Objects on the ground can affect the flow of wind, creating rapid changes in wind speed and direction. High winds make it difficult to maintain and hold flight position and will consume more battery. Uh, note here, wind shear is a sudden drastic change in the wind speed and or direction over a very small area. Wind shear can subject an aircraft to violent updrafts and downdrafts, as well as abrupt changes in the horizontal movement of the aircraft. Wind shears can occur at any altitude. And that's something that you'll see asked, can these occur at any altitude? Yes, wind shears can occur at any altitude, all right? However, it is particularly hazardous at low levels due to the proximity, proximity to the SUAS in the ground. And the problem there is obviously, if for some reason you get a downdraft and pushes you downward and you're close to the ground, well, you could crash, right? And you, you, you need to be aware of that. Um, I like down here, this little rule of thumb, um, just kind of skipping ahead. I'm not gonna read you all these slides. Um, the maximum wind speed should be no more than two thirds of the maximum air speed of the SUAS. I think that's like a nice little thing to know that I think a lot of UA pilots don't know. So like if you're going outside and you see the winds like, you know, kind of strong, but not too, too strong. It's like, is it too windy to fly? Well, this is kind of a good rule of thumb to go by. So if your maximum speed of your drone is 30 miles an hour, if the wind's more than 20 miles an hour, it's too windy for you to fly, right? So that two thirds rule is kind of a good way to go. Um, but that being said, you know, always abide by the owner's manual of your UA's maximum operating speed. Um, you know, uh, every UA is going to be different. So you need to know your particular aircraft. Um, wind speed is also measured, is often measured in knots. So you're going to need to know this term knots. Uh, they'll abbreviate this on the exam as KT. Uh, a knot is a measure of speed in nautical miles per hour. One nautic mile is equal to 1.15 statute miles. So this is kind of goes back to longitude and latitude, actually. We talked about this in that section. Therefore, one knot is equal to 1.15 miles an hour. Right? So for all of you wondering how fast one knot is, it's just a little faster than going one mile an hour. All right, this is really important. I really need you to understand this concept here that we're going to talk about, because this is a weird thing that they do in aviation. Wind directions are given in compass headings as measured from north to zero, right? So the wind compass direction reported is always in the direction in which the wind is coming from. So if we say the wind is, uh, we got an easterly wind, it means the wind is coming from the east, right? Here they give us an example, 45 degrees. So same thing here, they're using degrees instead of north, south, east, west, which is fine. For example, a wind direction of 45 degrees means the wind is coming from the northeast. For, it's coming from 45 degrees on our compass. Uh, I, I want you to understand this because this is the opposite of when we're talking about aircraft heading, right? So when we're talking about aircraft heading and we're saying the heading of an aircraft, it's the direction in which the aircraft is going. So if we're talking about wind and we're saying, hey, the wind is a northeasterly wind, it's coming from the northeast. Right? The wind is coming from the northeast and traveling to the southwest. But if we're talking about an aircraft and we're saying an aircraft is on a heading of the northeast, that means it's going to the northeast and coming from the southwest. You need to know those. If that is confusing, please rewind this video and rewatch that. If it's still confusing, ask a comment in the comment section. Right? So I'm going to read this out to you. No aircraft compass headings are always in the direction in which the aircraft is flying. An aircraft flying at 45 degrees is heading toward the northeast. Fixed wing aircraft always want to take off and land heading into the wind to maximize their lift capabilities at slow speeds, right? So know the difference. Wind is based on where it's coming from. Aircrafts are based on where it's going to. Got that? See how these are the same direction, but they're going in two different directions. The wind is, right? You got that? All right, ask me questions if you don't. Um, this, this might not be so much asked on the test, but again, these are kind of good things to know. Just be cautious when you're flying your UA. Again, my, so far my videos have mostly focused on the uh, FAA Part 107 exam, but in the future I plan on talking more about actual drones. Um, right now I just want to help folks with the FAA Part 107 exam. But in the meantime, I do want to point these things out. I don't think I'm 
I think I, you know, have an obligation to point some things out, even if they're not always on the exam. And I've told you this, you could have never flown a drone ever and passed this exam. It's more about the knowledge, not so much about knowing how to fly. But if you're getting the license, you should know how to fly too. And one thing I want you to be aware of is that wind speeds below the treetop, you know, might be safe. And then when you're with, like, so say you're flying and there's trees around you, the wind might be slower because it's blocked by the trees. And then but if you go, you know, get your drone above the trees, then it could get blown away by the wind, right? Because the wind could be stronger above the trees. Um, you know, so just be aware of that, right? Um, oh, here it kind of says that. Wind speeds above the trees, trees might exceed the safe speed and they could blow your drone away. So just be aware of that if you're in wooded areas and then you fly your drone above the trees. Okay. Um, Here's some other things that you really, I think we should know about. So we'll do a questions on and then we'll go over. So these are kind of things that they will more ask about. Um, one of the things that you'll notice on this exam is that you're gonna get a lot of questions that are relevant to airplanes, um, manned aircraft, not just uh, drones. They'll often maybe ask the question saying, you're flying a fixed wing drone, right? But how many people are flying fixed wing drones? Some, but not a ton. Most people are flying quadcopters. The FAA wants you to understand how aircrafts fly because they don't want you to run your drone into an aircraft. So you got to know a lot about fixed wing aviation, even if you're never going to fly a fixed wing, um, if you're going to pass this test. So it, if it doesn't seem like it applies to drone pilots, it might not, but you still got to know it if you want to pass the test. All right. Um, this one actually could still apply. So uh, just saying that because we got a picture of an airplane here. All right, wind shear can exist, and we said this earlier, at all altitudes. Yes, it's more dangerous when you're at lower altitudes, especially for manned aviation, right? Because when a manned aircraft crashes, it's really, really bad. Um, but it can wind shear can exist at all altitudes. I've said in past videos, when you see the all answer choice, it tends to be that. Now, I'm not saying it is every single time. I think I've seen one question, one. I mean, I've seen a lot of practice questions for the part one of an exam. I've seen one where there was an all answer choice and that was not the correct answer. But 95 plus percent of the time when there is an all answer choice, it's I. it has been the answer for me. Um, now, I'm not saying like if you feel confident that answers something else and it's not all, I'm not telling you to go against what you think and pick all. I'm just saying if you have no clue and there's an all answer choice, go with all. Um, it, it seems to usually be correct. All right, so wind shears can exist at all altitudes. A strong, steady wind exists out of the north. You need to photograph an area to the south of your location. You're, you are located in an open field with no obstructions. Which of the following is not a concern during this operation? Okay, so what's not a concern? Um, steady, strong winds coming out of the north and you need to photograph an area to the south, all right? Strong wind conditions may consume more battery power at a faster rate than uh, in calm conditions. Well, th yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, turbulent conditions will likely be a significant factor during the operation. Strong wind may exceed the performance of the SUAS, making it impossible to recover. All right. So, um, so here's the thing. Uh, sometimes you'll get a question where you get multiple answers where that they seem that they're right. And you got to be careful because they're trying to trick you here. Yeah, strong wind conditions are going to consume more battery at a faster rate than calm conditions. That's true. But does that answer the question for what we're talking about here? Um, so which of the following is not a concern? I mean, that's still a concern. And so you don't want to get tripped up with that. Turbulent conditions are likely to be a significant factor during this operation. That's not a concern. Why? Well, we're getting a strong wind out of the north, but we're, it didn't say anything about having like, um, it didn't say anything about having conditions that are going to create like uh, updrafts and downdrafts. So that's why it's not such a big deal. 
But this C is a big deal with strong wind conditions may exist, exceed the performance of the SUAS, making it impossible to recover. All right. So if we're going to the south and then there's strong wind coming out of the north, then getting back, we'll, we'll fly south real, real quick, real, real easy. But then getting back north, we might not be able to get back north because now we're going against the wind coming back and it could make it impossible to recover. All right. So, but turbulence, like, could we have turbulence here? Yes, we could have turbulence. And so I know this is a tricky question because it's like, it's a strong, steady wind. The key here is steady. And that's why turbulence isn't the right answer. Um, if it said like strong variable wind or strong wind with updrafts and downdrafts, then, you know, B could be correct. But here it's saying strong, steady. So it's strong wind, but staying steady. So that's why remember that turbulence is more created by that kind of updrafts and downdrafts. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please ask in the comment section. That one gets tough for folks because they feel like strong wind should be something you should be concerned of. And it should be, but it's just like, you know, what's the best answer? All right, uh, let's get into air masses and air fronts. A large body of slow moving air of relatively uniform temperature and moisture content is known as an air mass. When two air masses of dissimilar properties collide, the line of collision is known as a front. And I like the little graph that we have here. So, um, so advancing cold air is coming in and we had warm air here. Remember what's going to happen is warm air likes to rise. So it's going to get pushed above our cold air front coming in. Or we know this is a cold front because it's donated or it's denoted as the blue line with these little blue arrows. If it was a warm front, it would be a red line with, the, with red arrows here. So that's cold front there. Cloud development because of frontal lifting of warm, moist air. So that's what you're going to get is warm air gets pushed up and it's going to create clouds. Okay. All right. So here's our front types, cold front. The leading edge of an advancing cold air mass, often accompanied by poor weather. All right. You'll want to know this. Cold fronts are often accompanied by poor weather ahead of the front which passes relatively quickly. Because again, we're getting that warm air that's getting pushed up and creating those clouds. Um, once the front is passed, a wind shift can be expected along with turbulence, possibly thunderstorms, hail, and or tornadoes. Again, here you're getting, when you're getting cold air and warm air colliding, you're gonna get turbulence because you're gonna have air going up and down, right? When those front, fronts collide, you're having that warm air going up and that cold air coming down and that, creates turbulence because if a plane's coming through and the air is doing like this thing over here, that's obviously going to make the plane a little like less steady. Warm fronts, the leading edge of an advancing warm air mass, move about one half as fast as a cold front. This is a total question, right? This is like, this is the type of information they love to ask on the part 107 exam is like something like, which of the following could be characterized as moving half as fast as a cold front or, uh, you know, uh, something along those natures. So they could test you that warm fronts move half as fast as cold fronts. So remember that, write it down in a flashcard if that helps. Uh, and what actually I would do is I would take these down and I would get two flashcards and I would put cold front on the front side of one flashcard. And then I would write these three bullet points here. And then I'd get another flashcard and write warm front on the front of it and write these three bullet points on that one. Often preceded by lowered ceilings, increased precipitation, and reduced visibility. So know that with the warm front, you're getting that reduced visibility, okay? And here's a question. I, let me know in the comment section if you like this, like learn a little bit, get a question, learn a little bit, get a question. It's different than what I've been doing where I give you a bunch of information and then I'll do a separate video with a bunch of questions. So if you like this style, please give me a thumbs up and uh, a like. And then write it in the comment section. Just let me know if you like this style. Or if you don't like this style, let me know that too. And I'll go back to the other way. Um, one weather phenomenon, which will always occur when flying across the front, is a change in the, and pause the video if you want, okay, wind direction, right? So uh, when you're flying across the front, remember, you're getting two different types of air, the cold air mass and the warm air mass. You're going to have different wind directions. The zone between different temperature, humidity, and wind is called a, pause the video if you want, a front. This one should be an easy gimmick. 
All right, uh, let's do, did I say, M yeah, atmospheric stability. And um, actually I might do clouds on a separate video and do that with life cycle of a thunderstorm. Uh, so we might stop after this section. Um, atmospheric stability is defined, defined as the resistance of the atmosphere to vertical motion. A stable atmosphere resists upward and downward movement. An unstable atmosphere, on the other hand, allows an upward or downward disturbance to grow into vertical currents. Remember, vertical currents are bad, and that's what creates turbulence. We don't want that when we're flying. We like stable where we're getting horizontal currents, right, or not vertical currents. Unstable air can result in weather conditions unfavorable to SUAS operations. That should be pretty easy. Easy. Sometimes these things are counterintuitive. This one's not. This one's pretty straightforward. Unstable air is not good. All right, let's talk about stable air versus unstable air. I will say this, there's pros and cons to everything. It seems to be that there's no perfect um, weather condition. Like even like, like there's, there's always going to be a bad, right? So you, you'll even see with stable air, there's something bad about it. So let's talk about that. So characteristics of stable air, or unstable air. Let's go over unstable air first. Um, unstable air or... Uh, let's see, showery precipitation. So this meaning like precipitation where it's like gonna have, it's not steady, right? You maybe it's moving or a lot of wind or it could be coming sideways. You know, there's days where it's raining and you don't know if it's coming from, you know, going down, up, up down or sideways. It's coming at you at all angles. That, that'd be like the showery. Um, rough air, which is turbulence. That's gonna be unstable. But there's a positive with unstable air good visibility, except in blowing obstructions, right? So like if we're not having, you know, with unstable air, if you're, you're not having like a rainy situation, you could have good visibility. Um, that, that's something that you need to recognize. So like what, which, of, they might ask a question like this, which the following is a characteristic with unstable air. And they might put something like showery precipitation, rough air, and poor visibility, or which of the following is not a characteristic, sorry, is not a characteristic with unstable air, showery precipitation, rough air, or poor visibility. And you want to think, okay, it's unstable air, it's probably going to be everything's bad about it. Uh, the answer would be poor visibility, because with unstable air, you actually get good visibility. So there's like, there seems to always be a good and a bad. It doesn't seem to be we have a perfect weather condition. Uh, if there was something that was closest to perfect, it would actually be like dry, cold. Cold, dry air would be the probably best situation for flying. But that can even have some cons too, because you could get freezing and icing, but we'll talk about that later. Stable air, uh, you get the stratiform clouds and fog, right? Continuous precipitation. So that's steady, you know, those days with that steady precipitation, not really blowing a whole lot. You get smoother air, but you have fair to poor visibility with the stable air. And that's because, again, you can get more of those foggy conditions, right? So stable air, it's easier to fly in. It's more comfortable. You're not going to be rocking up and down, but you're going to have worse visibility. For UA pilot, like us, drone pilots, that's bad because we're not allowed to fly unless we can have three statute miles. I'm trying to get my fingers in the picture. Three, it's that mirrored image, you know, it's weird. Three statute miles visibility, meaning if you cannot see for three miles, you are not allowed to fly your UA. Right, so uh, you got to be aware of that. Maybe it's good stable air, but if you can't see three statue miles, you're not flying. Um, all right, so there's, like I said, pros and cons to everything. Uh, a stable air mass is most likely to have which characteristic? Okay, so a stable air mass is most likely to have which characteristic? And this is like, this is like those tricky questions. It's like, um, well, I, I remember there was something about precipitation in both of them, right? And it's like, Okay, I'm gonna go with that because it's easy to think stable air mass is good, so you would, you would have good visibility. But no, remember this. Remember this. There's always a good with the bad. There's always bad with the good, right? There's no perfect condition. So it's like if you have something bad about stable air, and that bad thing about stable air is usually poor visibility. Here's an example. I'll try not to show the answer this time. There we go. What would be what would decrease the stability of an air mass? Would it be warming from below, cooling from below, or decrease in water vapor? And the, if you look at this here, it kind of shows you the answer. So pause and pick. All right. And then so if you look at this, it will like um, show you the answer. Um, 
what what happens if you got here I'll show you the answers warming from below so if you have warm air from below what happens is is remember that air wants to rise because warm air likes to rise and cold air likes to fall so um that's going to decrease stability because you're going to get those updrafts and downdrafts i know this is like a hurricane structure but it still does like a good job of kind of depicting what's happening this warm air is getting sucked up and the cold air is getting pushed down so we're going to have your when you got warm air below you're going to get that unstable or air conditions all right I, let's go ahead and do this i said i was going to finish this section but i think this video is getting long so i'm going to close out here uh and uh and then i'll go over visibility and clouds in my next video if you enjoyed the video please give me a thumbs up and subscribe um also leave a comment i really really love it when you all leave a comment remember i'm just a i'm a i'm just a high school teacher um, so, um, uh, anyway, leave a comment in the comment section. I'll catch y'all next time. Thanks for watching Mr. Mix Classroom.